This is the Dollamore Daily, and I'm Jesse Dollamore. Yesterday, tyrant and war criminal, Henry Kissinger died at 100. I don't think that it's uh, uh, crass or, or inappropriate to point out the legacy of someone who's responsible for millions upon millions of deaths, and that is exactly what and who Henry Kissinger was. When Rush Limbaugh died, I did the same thing, pointing out what should be remembered as his legacy. And joining me today to talk about that very thing, the legacy of Henry Kissinger, is Cliff Schechter, who's been a long time, brother. Where you been? I, I don't know. Here, there, everywhere. You were off in New York, gallivanting around, showing the town. Sir, uh, I never I gallivant. You. No gallivanting. Okay, I've maybe never gallivanting? gallivanted. Like a, maybe a, just a bit of a sort of a, a slight kind of limp? Sachet. I, I sachet. <laughs> a sachet. I could see you sacheting. yes. Um, it has been a while. I'm glad to be back on. And um, I'm glad you started this off the way you did because, you know, I don't try to dance on people's graves. I don't get up and try to go, woo-hoo. Sure. But I cannot stand this sort of hagiography. I'm saying the word wrong. Hagiography? Whatever. The ass kissing. Can I say that? Yeah, yeah you um, can say that. That that happens when, when terrible people die and we want to start pretending that they were good people. And I've already seen it with a few, even people on the left who, you know, worked with him and knew him. And I don't care. Like, maybe he had a warm handshake. I don't think that if you were a victim of Pol Pot, you cared much what his yeah. handshake was like. So I'm not interested in that. He He was an absolutely awful human being. And the only thing that just boggles the mind is how he was able to successfully get a bipartisan because democrats are complicit in this absolutely too, group of people to just treat him like this elder statesman this you know this elite that should be at all of their parties when this guy should have been at the hague sitting next to milosevic and, right. and rwandan generals and the rest yeah, I'm I'm um, a little distracted. I, I would say this to the audience. If you're out there today and you're on Twitter or you're wherever you are online and you're seeing high-profile liberals and Democrats and people you respect, it's just as easy to keep your mouth shut on a day like today than it yeah. is to heap praise upon a man who's responsible for literal millions of deaths. I want to read very briefly for the audience's sake for those who, who may be a little younger or haven't paid attention to who Henry Kissinger is, this article that is perfectly titled in the Rolling Stone today by Spencer Ackerman, and here's the title, Henry Kissinger, war criminal beloved by America's ruling class, finally dies. <laughs> the infamy of Nixon's foreign policy architect sits eternally beside that of history's worst mass murderers, a deeper shame attaches to the country that celebrates him. And that's really what I want to talk about today is the yep. fact that this man, as you've mentioned, is beloved, is considered a man with a warm handshake. But there are millions of families across the planet who probably wouldn't uh, take that tack. So let me let me read a couple paragraphs from this. Sure. The Yale University historian Greg Grandin, author of the biography Kissinger's Shadow, estimates that Kissinger's actions from 1969 through 76, a period of eight brief years when Kissinger was made Richard Nixon's and then Gerald Ford's foreign policy and national security, uh, excuse me, and then Gerald Ford's foreign policy as national security advisor and secretary of state, meant the end of between three and four million people. That includes, quote unquote, crimes of commission, he explained, as in Cambodia and Chile, and omission like green lighting Indonesia's bloodshed in East Timor, Pakistan's bloodshed in Bangladesh, and the inauguration of an American tradition of using and then abandoning the Kurds. And then this really gets to, just cuts right to the quick here. Every single person who died in Vietnam between August 1968 and the fall of Saigon, and all who died in Laos and Cambodia, where Nixon and Kissinger secretly expanded the war within months of taking office, as well as all who died in the aftermath, like the Cambodian genocide, their destabilization set into motion, died because 
of Henry Kissinger. We will never know what might have been the question Kissinger's apologists and those in the U.S. foreign policy elite who imagine themselves standing in Kissinger's shoes insist upon when explaining away his crimes. We can only know what actually happened. What actually happened was that Kissinger materially sabotaged the only chance for an end to the war in 1968 as a hedged bet to ensure he would achieve power in Nixon's administration or Humphreys. A true tally of the death, I'll include that, uh, will probably never be known of everyone who died so Kissinger could be national security advisor. So it sickens me when I see high profile Democrats on the record as praising the elder, uh, now rotting statesman for the good that he did. How about you? Who I think on some level has been rotting for about 50 years now. Um, you know, again, I don't know that you can put it much better than that. Stalin and Hitler get, get all the fanfare and deservedly so. Sure. Terrible, terrible people. But if you don't know what Pol Pot did, and you want a quick refresher course, even if you don't have the time to read a book, just watch The Killing Fields. Absolutely. Um, if you want a quick refresher course, there's a number of movies, I can't think of the specific one right now, but about what we did in installing Pinochet in Chile, one of the larger mass murderers uh, in world history. It also led to destabilizing Argentina and the junta taking over there that led to the dirty war, people being thrown out of airplanes who were you know, over the ocean, who were, I mean, the thing is, is foreign policy, you know, so many things, if you destabilize one country, the country next to it gets destabilized and you, you can end up leading, you know, in a whole area into, into civil war, quagmire, murder. What he did in Vietnam, again, and illegally did in Cambodia, he did not, not that, I, I don't know why it wasn't illegal what he did in Vietnam, quite honestly, but, yeah. but it was illegal what he did in Cambodia. We had, did not have a war there. He chose because he thought, you know, and probably rightly so, the Viet Cong were hiding out there. It doesn't matter. We, we were not, didn't have a right to bomb there. And apparently from the, the quotes that were given, I'm trying to remember it was a general who said, it wasn't bomb the Viet Cong, it was anything you see moving or flying destroy. Yeah. Civilians were mass murdered in Cambodia. It led to this, the, as you pointed out, this huge sort of vacuum into which Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge, one of the most murderous regimes of all time, certainly of the last of the 20th and 21st century, stepped forward. And, and you know, as you said, the list could go on in eastern Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh, pushing forward uh, blood, you know, just a bloodbath there. He was awful. And I kind of feel like the bigger deal here is it led to some of the places we are today, because when you can forgive that kind of behavior and you can allow someone like that to remain in eminence grace, you know, to show up at all your parties with yeah, your yeah. nice little cocktails and your your little weenies in a bun and 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 all of that, you could do all of that and, and and break bread with this man who was a mass murderer. Well, then you know what's there to breaking bread with Mussolini or Idi Amin or some what what's the difference at some point? Yeah, listen, I don't want to boil this down to such simplistic terms that we don't acknowledge that foreign policy is messy work and oftentimes there are no right answers that anything you do is going to be lead to bad consequences. But some of the choices he made, many of the choices he made, most maybe of the choices yeah. he made were easy choices that didn't need to be made that wouldn't result in the deaths of millions of people. Th this was beyond the interest and the um, what was best for the United States from a foreign policy standpoint or a national security standpoint. This was just bad foreign policy. And so to trot this guy out as some sort of a uh, an elder statesman, again, to use the word or someone to go to for advice is a fool's errand, I think. Well, and it's and again, it's you're trying to have a moral authority to try to claim to the world that we support democracy. And we didn't. We overthrew democracies because yeah. of him. We defended yeah, the worst to totalitarian regimes. And so that to me is, is the key part about it. You're right. We're, we're learning it again right now in many parts of the world. Foreign policy is messy. And often the, sometimes innocent people die when you are actually doing the right thing. It is horrible. But it happens, you know, but it, it that he didn't try to do the writing. That's the thing. You see those quotes like the one I read you. I should have come prepared with a number of them in front of me. 
it was quite clear that that the lives lost was never even a calculation he made. Yeah. Innocent lives lost. Like he did not care. It was about self-advancement, advancement for the power of the party and for who he was working for. It just, it ne- you know, and, and, and what he saw as America's interests. And it never had anything to do, and his interests still came first, but it never had anything to do with, you know, there's no calculation. That's why I'm so, a lot of people are so happy Jimmy Carter outlived him because he spent so much time trying to discredit Jimmy Carter, yeah. who was the first president that had a foreign policy at least based somewhat on humanitarianism and actually cared and realized that maybe if you stop genocides, you save people, you help prop them up, you help, you know, support them. Wow. They may become productive members of society if you just don't blow them up. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so, I mean, it's just, it disgusts me. And, and I do think again, foreign policy is hard, but he did, he didn't care at all. And we're in a worse place right now for sure because of the people like him. And he's one of the worst of them. I want to end with this, and that is uh, uh, Anthony Bourdain, the late, great Anthony Bourdain. On his show, oftentimes with guests, in multiple episodes, he would ask them, if Henry Kissinger walked into this bar right now, how would you feel about if I walked up and punched him in the face? I love (laughs) To try to get their their reaction. And this is a quote that went around on Twitter last night in the wake of the news of Henry Kissinger's death. And we would not be doing our jobs as professionals Cliff Schechter, if we didn't didn't bring this to the audience, Uh, this was from his 2001 memoir, uh, uh, A Cook's Tour, I believe the name of the book is. Um, Once you've been, this is Anthony Bourdain, once you've been to Cambodia, you'll never stop wanting to beat Henry Kissinger to death with your bare hands. You will never again be able to open a newspaper and read about that treacherous, prevaricating, murderous scumbag sitting down for a nice chat with Charlie Rose or attending some black tie affair for a new glossy magazine without choking. Witness what Henry did in Cambodia, the fruits of his genius for statesmanship, and you will never understand why he's not sitting in the dock at The Hague next to Milosevic, as you mentioned earlier. I think I may have stolen that line from reading that Bourdain <laughs> quote earlier. Uh, by the way, uh, Slobodan Milosevic died in the died in prison where he should have died exactly. in 2006 and should have been a cellmate, should have had a cellmate in Henry Kissinger. Exactly right. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, very distressing. Very- uh, usually it's on, on, on more... Um, Fun terms to have you on the show. Sorry, this is such a bummer. Jokes you want to make before we go? before we go? We got everybody in the mood, all teed up. Yeah. So um, let everybody know where you are. I know your channel has been growing. That's fantastic. I would encourage everybody to go find your channel and subscribe. If you like the smart content and you're you're, you're tired of slumming it over here, go find Cliff. Where can they find you, Cliff? If you want some smart content with a smart ass attached to it, I would say. Go, which somewhat like this channel, I would say, uh, go, uh, go to at C Schechter and you'll find me on YouTube. Yeah. We're over 30,000 and growing. Thanks a lot to Jesse here. Uh, you can catch me at Cliff Schechter on Twitter, which may not be there next week. Apparently advertisers are not wanted from what I hear from Elon. Apparently and, they can go uh, fuck themselves. They can from what I hear. And then at Cliff D Schechter on, on threads, but at, at C Schechter on, on YouTube is the best spot. Awesome. So come by. Well, thanks for joining me on this auspicious occasion, the death of Henry Kissinger. Again, I don't want to, I don't care about dancing on his grave. He's not yet in the ground. There is no grave to dance upon. Thanks for joining me, Cliff. Frankly, if anybody ever deserved it, it would be this guy. (laughs) All right, everybody. Uh, Be genuine. Be genuine. And take care of one another.